welcome everybody. To, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dave Lobel here uh, to talk about sort of the cutting edge of, of remote sensing and crop, crop analytics. Uh, I've known David for a long time. We were uh, graduate students at the same time uh, at Stanford. That's the only similarity we have in terms of professional success. David has gone on to great things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but he, and we know that he was going to because he was a Brown graduate, so you know, came from very good pedigree. Uh, he was an applied math major uh, concentrator and worked with Jack Mustard um, on remote sensing stuff. Uh, went to Stanford, then did a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore, and then returned to Stanford where he is now faculty uh, leading the Center for Food Security and Environment, or in the Center for Food Security and Environment, and in the Environment or Systems Department. He's also a recipient of the MacArthur Award, uh, which is a fun, fun fact. And uh, I just looked at, now I know Jack is on sabbatical, so I can say this, but I just looked up that he has now uh, three more citations than than his old advisor here. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he just eked it out in time in time for this talk. So it's too bad Jack's not here, but Jack, if you're watching on video. <laughs> so anyway, without any further ado, welcome to David. Yeah, I was um I was wondering why Jack didn't come, but now I know. I, I, that I did not know before. Um, well, thanks for coming. This is uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many students, actually. I went to Brown for four years. I don't think I ever went to a Friday afternoon uh, anything. <laughs> I was usually out on the quad juggling, actually, Friday afternoon. I don't know if that still exists, but that was a great skill to pick up here. Um, maybe, it, maybe it explains my, my professor's uh, life, juggling everything. Anyhow. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, agriculture. This is what uh, I've ended up sort of focused on in my research. Um, but let me start by explaining and, and talking about some of the environmental motivations, and then I'll hopefully make the connections throughout. Um, when I was an undergrad here, uh, as Stephen mentioned, I was a applied math, but I was interested in the environment and um, issues like this. Uh, so habitat loss, deforestation, um, it's something that I was, you know, I guess, aware of and concerned about. Um, and at the same time, things like water quality, um, big hypoxic zones in the in the um, in the sea with lots of fish dying. Uh, and I think one of the things I realized at Brown, um, and and maybe a little bit afterwards, is that these big environmental problems were fundamentally related to agriculture. That they weren't existing because we had a whole bunch of evil people. Running around dumping things, uh, you know, just for the purposes of polluting the water or, or cutting down trees just for kicks. Although, in the cartoons my kids watch, sometimes that's what happens. You have like this evil person just trying to kill as many animals as possible. Um, but in reality, it's it's actually these are both very much the product of of people's attempts to feed themselves and their families. And I, I guess the good news is that since I was under here about 20 years ago, uh, these problems I would say have not gotten a lot worse, and that. <coughs> Is something. I mean, there's something to be said for not getting a lot worse. You can't take for granted, um, as, as we've learned over the years, that you can't take for granted just sort of maintaining status quo. And I tell my wife often that, like, I have lost hair since undergrad, but I could have lost a lot more hair. So, um, you know, just staying the same isn't so bad, but we haven't actually solved these problems by any means. And um, I suppose that um, continues on. For example, if you look at sort of the environmental issues around water pollution, and the, um, all of the non-point sources into the Gulf of Mexico, for example, people have looked at how this has changed over time. And you can see that, um, for better or worse, in 2017, we're now, or we were, kind of setting the, the all-time record. So this certainly is not a problem that has gone away. Again, it hasn't gotten dramatically worse, which is also saying something given that we produce a lot more food than we did 20 years ago, a lot more people in the world, um, a lot more production within the US in particular. and so. This isn't maybe a failing grade, but it's certainly not uh, an A. If you look at deforestation, there's lots of different ways of measuring this. This is a plot um, I find interesting from the Global Carbon Project, looking at sources of carbon in the world. And I like it partly because it shows you trends in land use change and deforestation-related emissions have um, improved a little bit, at least in trend, you know, over the last 40, 50 years, especially over the last 20 years, um, especially if you start in the El Nino of 98. But, uh, it certainly hasn't gotten away, but you can see that it has 
you know, gone down a little bit, and compared to all the emissions associated with energy production, you know, not going up dramatically is actually a pretty big success. Um, however, you know, as I said, you can't sort of be guaranteed to, to stay the same. You also can't guarantee that that, project, that progress will continue. And in particular, in agriculture, when we think about deforestation, we think about food prices, we think about overall trends between supply and demand. And what we see in the agricultural world is that the supply trends in many regions are, are somewhat concerning. So uh, this is just a simple plot of yields, so the amount of produced per area over time in different parts of the world, um, some work by Patricio Gersini and others, looking at three major commodities, wheat, rice, and maize in different regions. And you can see in lots of places there was historical progress. And in the last, say, 10 to 15, sometimes 20 years, in many regions we see sort of a ceiling. And if that ceiling were to become a global phenomenon, what you would have is prices rising much like they rose um, in 2008 and 2011, which then precipitates a lot of, of incentive to clear land. You have um, partly causing this and, and also going into the future, the expectation that you'll have lots of climate-driven changes in productivity. And I put this um, example in for Amanda, who then prompted, uh, uh, prompted her to get sick, I guess, and, and not show up either. So now I've, I've kept Jack and Amanda away from this talk. But um, this shows you the, the last, actually, um, 20, 25 or 30 years, I can't remember exactly, let's say 30, uh, of what the climate trends in Australia have done to the wheat crop in Australia. And all these reds are, are negative effects. Basically, the changes in temperature and rainfall are reducing the yield potential of wheat. And as a result, you can see historically they were making uh, steady progress in wheat with a lot of you know, volatility characteristic of Australian <laughs> conditions. Um, but in the last 30 years or so, or 25 years, actually the yields have, have not gone up in, in any significant way. And the authors essentially say that the, the country has done well just to maintain given all of these negative climate pressures. So going forward, there are um, significant concerns about climate impacts. There are significant concerns more generally about maintaining these productivity increases, which historically have allowed deforestation to at least stabilize and if not, if not get better. So these problems, uh, again, not going away, but you can also see signs uh, Recently, this is just showing you global staple crop area. We were pretty stable for a long time. We've been remarkably successful at keeping up with global food demand without expanding areas. But in the last decade or so, we've seen now an increase in, in um, primary crop area. A lot of this comes out of grazing land or other agricultural lands. But there is signs of both stagnation and yields in lots of places and um, increased pressures on land. So this is not a good story from an environmental standpoint, at least in the very recent past. Um, OK, so what I'll talk about, given sort of this motivation of, of these, there's seats up here, by the way, if you guys want to um, venture into the, the front. Uh, in, in terms of getting beyond sort of this general environmental motivation for caring about um, agriculture, what I'll talk specifically today about is um, what I'm calling crop analytics, or you can call all sorts of things, but that's just a nice shorthand for essentially very data-intensive management of crops and very data-intensive studies of crops to understand different, um, uh, different opportunities for improving things. Um, and then in particular, I'll talk about satellites as a source of data. And just I think some of you are already aware of this, but just to give sort of all of you an impression of how uh, different things are than they were even a few years ago and how uh, exciting it is. Um, and then I'll talk about two examples from research. At lunch, um, and, and I'm at risk here of going off into tangents, you know, going down memory lane being at Brown, but at lunch I was telling students about my time here at Brown. The only reason I got a position with Jack, and I remember him meeting with him, asking him if he had a research position, and he said, well, actually, we do have some budget, in, uh, extra budget, because we had written our NASA proposal for Landsat at $4,000 a scene, and they just reduced the price to $600 a scene. And those of you who work with Landsat uh, now know that it's completely free. Uh, but it wasn't always free. And, it, and I spent my entire summer doing things that now happen you know, in a matter of seconds on software. So um, of, of course, in the 20-year time scale, it's not going to surprise you that we've made tremendous progress in, in satellite data. But even in the last two or three years, there's been some, um, the reality is, is, is quite exciting. All right, so crop analytics. Why, um, why do we need this? Why do I think this would be, why am I arguing that this is an important part of um, improving the environment? So I'll just um, I'll kind of spare you a bunch of slides and just talk about farmers in general. And, I, and when I say in general, 
I'm going to be generalizing here, but here's a, a picture of two farmers um, I had opportunities to talk with recently, one in Iowa and one in Uganda, so very different ends of the spectrum. Um, and they're making different sets of decisions, but essentially the point here is that all farmers are making a series of decisions. And all those decisions, or let's say most of those decisions, are fraught with all sorts of uncertainty associated with the decision, so it's not obvious to them what the best decision is. It's, it's often not obvious um, even after the fact, but it's certainly not obvious uh, ahead, of, ahead of time. So for example, a farmer in Iowa is often concerned about things like which seeds should I be buying, um, uh, what are the right sowing densities and sowing dates and all of this thing. And in, when it comes to things like fertilizer, which is driving a lot of the, um, the water quality issues that I mentioned, <coughs> questions like how much to apply, obviously, also when to apply, what forms to apply, all of these things um, are decisions that they make. And, and this uh, woman and most farmers have you know, spreadsheets where they're doing their calculations of what does it pay to do. Um, and they evaluate new technologies as they come online. You can see her new, uh, very sophisticated machinery there that's all, that's all equipped with GPS and auto drive and everything like that. But they're making very real decisions in the face of uncertainty, uncertainty about not only the weather, but uncertainty about every different aspect of every part of their field. It's a, it's a complicated problem. Um, a different set of questions may be made by the woman on the right, but of the same type of flavor in the sense that it's a, a decision made under a lot of uncertainty. In this case, it's simply like, is it really worth my while to buy inputs? Um, there's uncertainty not only about uh, you know, a given input, what response will it have, there's also a lot of uncertainty in the market about, am I getting what I'm actually paying for? And that's a different issue. Um, can I, uh, should I buy sort of insurance or get credit? And, and credit is a hugely important thing when you're a resource poor farmer in terms of being able to front the cash for, for inputs. Um, and maybe they don't have the resources to optimally manage their crop, but, but understanding in a very um, uh, robust way what is the most important single thing that they can do. And I often found it surprising that they would, um, that they, they would ask me lots of questions as if I was the extension. They don't often have lots of access to good extension and good um, information. And a key thing here is, is the service providers, the, the services that very poor farmers in the world have access to are generally poor because a lot of these service providers really don't know how to evaluate the person that's coming forward or the person that they're contacting. Is this a, is this a credible uh, investment for me as a, as a loan officer? Um, what do I know about this person's field? Like in the US, you can get very detailed information on whether the, what's the yield history of this farmer, what's the quality of their field, et cetera. That information is often completely absent in these environments. And it creates a real problem in terms of you may get really good, worthy farmers who just aren't getting access to affordable inputs or affordable credit because they just can't prove their credit worthiness. So, so this is one area where data could be quite useful. So the point here is just generally that if you look in detail at all sorts of um, environmental issues, they, they essentially trace back to farmer decisions. And if you look at those decisions, they're um, always plagued by different sources of uncertainty that are getting cheaper and cheaper to resolve. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of you have, have sort of been aware that data is getting um, more ubiquitous. It's, a, it's really a commodity in most places now. And, and probably many of you are, are familiar with examples of, of how it then helps to make better decisions. Um, I'll talk a little bit about agriculture, but I, I think probably the best thing is to just argue that there's no reason it shouldn't help in agriculture, just like it helps everywhere else. And you can see examples all over. Um, my favorite example is, maybe not surprisingly to those who know me, um, about basketball. So this is, for you, the Golden State, um, picture of the Golden State Warriors. Apologies to the Celtics fans in the room, um, because you have to be for the Celtics. But the, the, the apologies also for, for bringing this example up. Uh, it is a, a story of, of, for those of you who don't know, the, the Warriors have been a historic team over the last few years. But they actually didn't do it simply by you know, drafting the best players. They actually never had the top draft picks in the draft. They, they, these three are the core of the team. We're all you know, somewhat mid to, to late uh, round picks. Maybe, maybe not mid, but, but not the highest picks in the draft. But a lot of what their strategy was based on was picking personnel and a strategy for those personnel that matched what the latest data was showing. And, and a few years back, um, basketball transitioned to this very data intensive um, uh, operation of basically collecting information on where every player moves every second, where every shot is taken, how that shot is taken. And they started analyzing this and realizing, for example, that in basketball, this shows you the points per shot in the NBA. 
So red is, is better, more points per shot. And they realize very quickly that you're essentially strategically making a mistake if you're not shooting either layups or three-pointers. That, that if you're taking long uh, two-pointers, this is what this guy calls the land of forsaken dreams and the land of abandoned glories, for those of you who can't read it, um, that this was bad strategically. And then on top of that, as I said, they have information on exactly what happens before the shot and as like where the defender is, et cetera. But this is quite striking, same color scale here, but this is shots that are being taken off of dribbles or, or you know, after a player is standing still for a while. And this is uh, shots off a pass. And the entire, essentially, Warriors system is, is predicated on ball movement and shooting threes, especially from the corner, uh, cutting to the lane, taking dunks. And their entire defense is predicated on stopping other teams from, from doing that. Um, no, so, so there are the Kyrie Irvings out there that can dribble themselves all around and create um, incredible, uh, or make incredible shots. But in terms of a winning strategy, uh, and, and I'm not, it's hard to pick on the Celtics. They're a great team. They've won 10 in a row, I think. Um, but but the, uh, the point here is that you know, when I was a kid, you know, we thought it couldn't get any better than Michael Jordan and, and the Bulls. And, and in fact, more data you know, pushed it to a new level. Um, OK, enough about that. Um, so, so how do we get the equivalent sort of, uh, of this for agriculture? And um, the, the short answer is that in some places, we already have something resembling that. Because farmers in the US, for example, do actually, as I showed you that fancy tractor, do collect all sorts of very precise information. That information is often fed into software um, provided by their, their service providers. In this case, I think this is a picture yeah, from Pioneer's website, where they can see detailed maps. They can actually have the software feed in um, uh, essentially decisions into their tractor to know to drop different amounts of fertilizer and different amounts of seed in different parts of their field. So this is starting to come along, but it is um, still very much a, a, a nascent area. And, and I think my point here is that although it is coming along in the, in the richest of the rich environments for agriculture, it, it's still pretty costly. It's still not proven in any sense. And it's still m way more costly than can be done in, in sort of the bulk of the world where we grow food. And so um, what I think is a much more, let's say, low cost and, and attractive option is, is satellite data. So this is just a quick, uh, I'll give you like a three or four minute um, summary on where satellite data is at. So here's the, the tried and true Landsat um, sensors that go back to the 80s that, I, as I said, used to cost quite a bit, but now are free. Um, and they're on the order of 30 meter resolution for optical data. Um, and they revisit the same spot on Earth every 16 days. So you can piece together during, a, say, a three or four month growing season. If you're lucky, you can piece together a couple images. But typically, clouds prevent you from getting more than a couple or, or three. Uh, there has been, since 2009, uh, Rapid Eye, which is a five meter uh, uh, resolution. A little bit more frequent, but it doesn't sample everywhere in the world. So this is a little bit um, incomplete in terms of the information I'm giving you here. But this was quite attractive, although also quite expensive uh, until recently. Um, and then down here, what you have is this new crop of sensors, which are representative of even a broader suite of sensors, but really represent uh, a step change in the frequency. So you can see now with Planet, for example, um, and for those of you, I've talked to several of you up about Planet. I know some of you are using the data. Planet is a company. Planet Scope is, is their main sort of set of sensors. These are essentially shoebox size. Um, little what they call doves to, to sound very peaceful so people don't get concerned about um, the technology. But essentially lots, uh, hundreds even, of these little doves in a constellation with very small, low, low cost uh, to launch sensors um, acquiring data at a daily time step, as I'll show you in a second, uh, at three meter resolution. SkySat is also now owned by Planet. It's a different set of sensors that were purchased uh, by Planet. And they are much higher resolution, well, much, but they're sub or one meter resolution. And, um, and they are not as frequent because of that higher resolution. They can't map everywhere in the world. And there are not as many of them. But they're now, they just launched, I think, five or six more. So there's, they're getting to the point where every place in the world could be seen at a daily resolution, at a daily at a resolution of three meters, and maybe weekly at a, at a higher resolution of one meter. And then Sentinel-1 and 2, how many of you have heard of these, just, just to get a sense of the audience here? OK. Um, these are quite exciting in that they are public goods. These are, these are private sector investments. These are public goods, 10 meter resolution, and not only optical data uh, and quite detailed optical data, you can see more bands, but also radar data. 
Radar is great because it sees through clouds. And so this, in the tropics, as I'll talk about with small other systems, clouds are always an issue. Um, six day or five day, uh, I should say five, five day revisit uh, at 10 meter resolution. Like this would have blown my mind, you know, a few years ago. Very good quality and, and frequent data. All right, so let me give you a sense for those of you who aren't used to working with it. Um, this is a Landsat image in, in Iowa. So you can hopefully pretty clearly see, and I'm sorry for this side of the room, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll go over here now. To the, to the <laughs> um, you can hopefully clearly see the, the outlines of individual fields, right? Um, this is like a, a, an image taken right around planting, so there's not a whole lot of green stuff. Uh, and here is the same resolution image, 30 meter resolution, in one of the areas we work in Kenya. Uh, ignore the clouds for now, although this is something you can never, you know, it, you always expect a little bit of clouds in the tropics. Uh, but you can't really make out anything. I mean, maybe you can make out like a field here or something. Um, so my point here is that we've had for over 20 years the ability to access information about uh, large fields in, in commercial areas. And, and I've worked a lot in, um, in, for example, Mexico. There's a lot of commercial areas in Mexico. And around the world, you can find lots of places where Landsat is useful. But most of the interesting parts in terms of food security um, and many environmental outcomes is in areas like this, where you know, if you're lucky, you're getting a general sense, but you can't see individual fields. Now, here's that same Bugoma image on the, um, on the left, that, that Landsat image. And here's what that same area looks like uh, in SkySat. I, I could have taken Planet or even Sentinel in this region. But this gives you a sense of what one meter, uh, well, actually, I've resampled this even to, to just to re reduce the file size. So this is actually a 10 meter uh, snapshot of what it looks like. And now I want you to get a sense of how frequent it is. And you can actually watch the landscape changing on a, on a weekly basis. And you can imagine that now you can sort of learn all sorts of things about how these different fields are performing, even what management practices are being used, potentially when they're sowing, when they're <laughs> harvesting, what kind of crops they're growing, et cetera. Um, I thought it was going to loop. But yeah, so you can get a sense of just the dramatic increase from having this once or twice a season having something like this. Um, and this is, again, a very recent phenomenon, but we could see it coming down the line. And so we've been essentially trying to get ready for it and trying to be able to use it in terms of creating products and, and doing science. Um, Planet, I mentioned this is a nice little graphic that they made. It's um, much slicker than, than anything I have to show you. So uh, from, from 2015, they were, you know, this was like classic Silicon Valley, you know, uh, venture capital and hype, but no, no actual product. Um, but in mid-2016, so this shows you different constellations that are being launched, you know, different amounts of shoeboxes being thrown up into space. And some of them crash and burn as designed. It's designed to be kind of disposable cameras. Um, but then in mid-2016, they had a big launch. Uh, and then they were acquiring something like 50 million square kilometers a day. And then in early 2017, they had another big launch. And this was a little bit of an old figure. But we're now up to the point where essentially we're covering 150 million square kilometers per day. We, they, um, are doing this with climate imagery. And for those of you who are, um, are scientists, you'll know that 150 million square kilometers is actually the uh, ice-free land surface of the Earth. So essentially, they're getting an image of everywhere in the world every day at, at 3 to 5 meter resolution. But even a year ago, that wasn't, well, where are we now? We're here. So yeah, that wasn't the case. Um, so, it, well, as I said, we've been trying to make sense of all this data in terms of mapping all sorts of things, crop management, um, crop types, but in particular crop yields. So I'm going to um, kind of yada yada over the best part here in terms of uh, how we actually do that. And I'm happy to answer questions. But essentially, we, we have a system that we take uh, various types of imagery. Um, so we're kind of agnostic to the source of imagery. And we take a bunch of weather data, which is important for crops. And we integrate it um, not using a bunch of field data, because the sort of premise of this whole approach is that if we're going to wait around for a bunch of field data to be collected to really calibrate some sort of machine learning model, it's going to just take too long. It just does that kind of high quality data doesn't exist. And I'll get a little bit more into this. Um, so what we do is we, we essentially simulate a bunch of data. Uh, and we use that as a way of training the model, hoping that that's realistic enough that it will do a good job in, in reality. Um, we call this thing. Um, uh, skim, just, just to you know, save time saying scalable or crop yield or whatever we're talking about. Uh, we're talk calling it skim, and we get things like yield maps. So here's an example for the US. We've tested this out a lot on the Landsat data that, as I said, was useful in the US. Um, you can see here the whole Corn Belt and uh, a subset. I think I, 
I forgot to put in the, the zoomed, like where you can see individual fields, but you can sort of see it here. This is a, a picture of the Corn Belt showing you the average uh, maize yield that we estimate over a series of, over a decade of Landsat uh, images. So for each year we estimate for the areas where corn is growing, which we get from the USDA, they have maps of where corn is growing. Uh, we estimate the yields and then this is just an average over that time. You can see, you know, there are some areas that are quite high yielding, there are some areas that are, that are you know, lower productivity. Um, and you can see the, the, that heterogeneity exists at multiple scales. So even within, say, a high yielding region, you'll have lots of low yielding fields. Um, we've tested this against a lot of the published uh, public data at the county level. So this is taking this map, uh, aggregating it up by county and comparing it to, uh, on, that's on the x-axis, comparing it to what the, the USDA reports for each county. And this is for the last eight years. So, so we're fairly confident that we're picking up something real. It's not maybe perfect, although neither is NAS, but it's, again, essentially free and, and nearly instantaneous. Using Google Earth Engine, which I've talked to you some about this, this all of the processing for all the years takes less than a couple of hours. Um, uh, that might be a slight exaggeration. So let's say a year takes less than a couple of hours, and, and all of it you know, takes a day. Um, and so one thing uh, we've been doing is, is trying to understand, so, so what? Like, we have these pretty maps. Should we just, uh, maybe they're not even pretty. I mean, they're, they're maps. Uh, what, what do we do with them? So one thing we've been doing is just trying to be descriptive about what do we know about heterogeneity, both over space uh, and time, in terms of how that's changing uh, with time. And one of the interesting things we see is here, here you have Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois, and, and you get a bit of a better look at the heterogeneity here. One of the things we see, which was quite interesting in trying to understand trajectories of yields in, in a region like the US, is that the, the heterogeneity has actually grown over time. So this shows you just a simple uh, PDF, a, a distribution of the yields across this region in the first three years of the record in red and the last three years in the record. I didn't want to put all here to confuse you, but the, um, the point here is that average yields have been going up. But actually, the, the worst yields have not been going up. It's really been sort of the distribution sh spreading more than just shifting. And so the high, yield, the high end yields are going up, the mean yields are going up, and things are getting wider. Um, we can actually investigate that a little bit more by trying to understand what are these low yielding areas, what are these high yielding areas, and, and combining it with different data sets like uh, soil quality from, from the Sergo data sets in the US, the soil survey data sets from USGS. This just shows you the, what's called the National uh, Commodity Crop Productivity Index. This is, this is like the USGS's assessment of how, um, of how productive a soil is. And they have this at some fine resolution, which is part real and part made up. Um, and this is the root zone characteristics of, in terms of water holding capacity. And what we see is that, in fact, a lot of the heterogeneity is associated with soil qualities. That's not too surprising. Um, what this shows you is the average difference between fields with the highest quartile and the bottom quartile of NCCPI. So we wanted to essentially, uh, and this is for the econometricians in the room, uh, control for omitted variables here. So we're just looking within counties at the difference between the best and the worst soils. Because if you look broadly, like at, you know, sure, southern Illinois has the worst soils, but they're also different in 300 other ways from northern Illinois. So we're looking within each county at this difference. And we see that there is always a positive difference, which makes sense, soils matter. But you can see that difference growing over time in corn quite dramatically. It's over double the difference that it was even in 2000. Um, happens to be the year I graduated, but that's not, not relevant here. Um, and and uh, soybean, in, in fact, doesn't show that trend. And one of the things we think is going on here is, um, uh, and, and we can get more into this later, but is essentially that the technologies that have been driving the maize yield expansion is, is largely associated with uh, intensification of sowing density and more fertilizer. And that works well if you have the soils that could hold the water to support that. But it doesn't really benefit you much if you're, um, if you're on poor soils. And so uh, I think the question going forward is how, you know, at what point, so we see that only about <coughs> half of the Corn Belt really has a significant growth that's actually driving aggregate growth. And, and, and you know, how long can that be sustained um, without irrigation is a, is a big question. There's also some sign in here, I think, this is reflecting the adoption of these precision techniques that I was showing you with that farmer, that they are being smarter about putting inputs onto the better parts of their soil. So they're not foregoing the high yields on those really good parts of the land that they might have been foregoing before when they just applied a uniform application. And actually, following on from that, uh, what we're trying to do now is see 
how well can we use these very cheap uh, large scale estimates to actually improve uh, nitrogen decisions? And, and this is not to say that we are going into the business of farmer recommendations for nitrogen, but there are a whole lot of companies that are going into the business. And as a scientist, what's interesting, I think, to figure out is not only how to do that well, but you know, how significant will this be as a strategy to reduce over fertilization? Is this really going to be a you know, 2% of the solution or is it going to be 70% um, of the solution? So what we're trying to do now is, is take our images of yields, um, cluster the, the fields, indiv individual fields. So here's an individual field of maize. Cluster the field into different management zones. This is what these companies generally do. You can cluster based on average yields. You can cluster based on a sequence of year, yields over year. And so here, for example, we've defined high, medium, and low three zones in this field. You can see it sort of corresponds as it should to, to the yield distributions. And then we know that, uh, and maybe this is worth explaining in a little bit of detail, we know that a low yielding area that has limited yield potential for whatever reason, maybe it's like a really sandy area of the field, or maybe it's just you know, poor quality for some reason, uh, it's not going to be, so this shows you as simulated yields as a function of nitrogen inputs. Each individual year of the simulation is shown in a dark line, and the average is shown in a red line. Um, it's not going to be worth your while. And in fact, the optimum fertilizer rate is below 150, in this case, pounds per acre. Um, not going to be worth your while to throw a lot of nitrogen on because it won't respond. It's, it's limited by other things, and you're just wasting your money. And that fertilizer is ending up in the Mississippi, and it's ending up in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but if you're a high yielding area, you'd be really a bad farmer and a bad businessman if you were only applying 150 um, pounds per acre because you'd be foregoing all of that extra profit from the extra yield. So this is the fundamental question, again, our decision around fertilizer amounts that farmers have to make. And if they know ahead of time that this part of my field will respond or won't respond, it obviously could help them. But the question is, how much does it help them? And now that we have this long history for every field in the Corn Belt, we can look at sort of the distribution of benefits. Um, and so we're starting to do that. This is, and so you have what's called variable rate technology, where you're applying the optimum as a function of the management zones versus the uniform rates, which is sort of the old way of doing it. And we're trying to quantify now, like how beneficial is it, both in terms of the, the economic benefits to the farmers, but also in terms of the reduction in the leaching. Um, and these units are, you know, um, perhaps not meaningful right now in terms of how they're expressed here in absolute values, but. But what we're trying to do is develop an understanding of really what is the, the possibilities here in terms of, and, and also what are the best ways to do it. So is it best to cluster on some you know, very clever metric of, of yield history so you're, you're um, optimizing the, the reduction? And then also just how much of what companies are doing is just not going to make sense economically, and, and we shouldn't count on that as a strategy for, for reducing uh, pollution. Maybe we should have other strategies like spring, plant, uh, spring applications or some combination. All right, so this gives you a sense of sort of the high end of the spectrum of how satellites potentially can bring the cost down of these more precise um, technologies. Now let's switch over to um, the small order systems, which is really what I've been spending most of my time on thinking about lately, which uh, here's again this, this farm in Uganda. We've been working throughout Eastern Africa and also throughout Eastern India, um, trying to understand what is the potential uses of these types of technologies and, and how could they help. And in particular, the World Bank was very interested in and essentially just getting better statistics on, on how productive the systems are and how heterogeneous they are. And so what they um, were able to do was invest in a very large field campaign where, where crop yields were measured in three different ways. And we then came in with our satellite approach to compare. Um, this shows you the area in Uganda um, near Lake Victoria. And we have here, and this is a case of three Sentinel-2 images. These are the three good ones. The other ones were completely cloudy, but we got lucky enough to have three decent images. Um, and this, these yellow polygons here show you all the fields that we um, collected data on. And the way we did this, as I said, is we tried to measure yields in multiple ways. So for all the crops, we asked the farmer, how much did you produce on this plot of land? Right, that's how it's done in 95% you know, of development work. You go and ask farmers about things, and you take their answers. Um, we also did what's kind of considered the gold standard of going out into the farmer's fields after you ask them. Uh, or actually, in this case, before, because they haven't harvested yet, you ask them uh, permission to go out and cut a particular section of their field. You randomly place that, in this case, an 8x8. Eight eight. You can see the, the, the markings of the outline. And you harvest every bit of grain in that, and you measure it, you weigh it, you divide by the area, and that gives you some objective measure of yield. 
So as I said, this is the most common. This is sort of the gold standard. And then the like, not even gold standard because it's so expensive that nobody in their right mind would ever do it. But the, if you really want a good estimate of yields, you harvest the entire field for them or with them. Um, you usually give them like a small gift and, and pay them to help you harvest. And then you count up the, grain, the, the cobs. And this is how farmers usually store their grain. Um, they, they let it dry out on the, on the ground. OK, so these are sort of the three field-based measures. Uh, and then this is the satellite, just a satellite image of these individual fields. And we're going to apply the same machinery I showed you in the US, where we run a bunch of simulation models, we train the um, model, and then we predict. <coughs> now, uh, I think this is a, a, a good slide, especially for the students who are um, first getting into thinking about these things. And I think as a student, you're used to sort of absorbing information as fact, when in fact, most information that you see is somebody's guess about what fact is. And in the case of developing uh, countries, to some extent, in developed countries as well, um, it's really a poor approximation of what truth actually is. So this is simply showing you the distribution of the yields that we got from the full plot harvest, which we only did on about 200 of the 500 fields um, because of the expense of it, uh, the crop cut harvest, which we did on every field, and the self-report. Okay, So what you see, hopefully, this is the distribution. These are the, the means. Um, the crop cut and the full plot show pretty similar distributions, pretty similar means. Less than a ton per hectare, which if you're used to think about these things is quite low. This is a pretty low production, uh, low productivity area. Uh, the self reports, on the other hand, give you an average yield of about twice what the objective measures do. Um, and that's driven a lot by some very optimistic farmers in the sense that they over report their production and they actually very um, heavily tend to under report the amount of area that they have. If that makes sense. So they are telling you they got, they're not telling you their yield, they're telling you their production and their area, you divide the two. And often when a farmer says they have a quarter acre of land, they actually have like 0.45 acres and they think they have a quarter of an acre and so their, um, their self-report yields are, are off. Um, it, it's interesting actually, small, the smallest, the farmers who own the smallest fields tend to overestimate, um, sorry, uh, tend to underestimate in this particular area how how much land they have, but it's not the same everywhere you look. This, it's, it's always true that they're way off, but it's not always true that they always underestimate. Over so we still don't quite understand why. Um, but even within the two objective measures, so even the gold standard, this crop cut, compared to, like I would say, the ideal, which is the self-report, it's kind of weird to use those two terms uh, in contrast to each other, the, the gold standard and the ideal. Uh, they, they're not that highly correlated. I mean, they're, they're decently correlated, which is good. Um, if you look at all fields, the correlation is about 0.5. If you look at just fields that are removing those super small ones where you could be thrown by a very small denominator, it's still only about 0.57 um, between the cross cuts and the, full, and the full plot. And that's not because there's a lot of measurement error. It's because the fields are very heterogeneous. So if you just throw a random 8 by 8 plot out there, even in a pretty small field, if you're talking about like a, a tenth of a hectare, that's still 1,000 square meters. And 8 by 8, for those of you who um, thinking about the beer afterwards, that's 64 square meters. And so you're still only sampling a very small fraction. And in a heterogeneous system, that just won't cut it in terms of, of that. All right, so that was sort of a, a bit of an introduction to the field data. Here's, again, what the satellite data look like. You'll notice that there's all this junk going on between the clouds, all this wispy stuff, which is problematic. You'll notice in traditional indices like NDVI, or in this case, uh, the green chlorophyll index. Some of you are familiar with these. Um, if you're not, don't worry about it. But you can see a lot of heterogeneity in NDVI, but a lot of that seems an artifact of these atmospheric conditions. This is kind of a well-known thing that if you've got scattering, it's generally much, well, it is preferentially scattering in shorter wavelengths, so it screws up all these indices that compare long and shorter wavelengths. Um, what's nice with Sentinel-2 is you can, there's a lot of red edge measurements, and this is just kind of for the wonks in the room for remote sensing. You don't see these same artifacts appear because you're looking at differences between very nearby bands, and, and the scattering is very similar. So what I'm about to show you is that this one works the best, and this will give you some intuition about why that is. Um, when we look at, this is just showing you the correlation between our measures from satellite and the, field, the three different field-based measures, or this actually is just the two best field measures, the full plot harvest, which are the best, and then the crop cuts, which are second best. For two of those dates, this shows you the correlation between the three different indices. And I already explained why the green ones are higher than the others. Um, but let me just point out the scale here. So this was about where the correlation was between these guys and these guys. And we're sort of very competitive with that in terms of our satellite measures are more, actually more correlated with the full plot harvest than, than where the 
the 8 by 8 crop cuts. So what? So that means that essentially with very cheap technologies, we're able to do a better job reproducing these super expensive um, techniques. And that's exciting for lots of reasons. One is that we can then start to actually have good yield measures for entire landscapes, whereas before we essentially didn't know very much about any of the, the landscape. Um, this shows you if you combine these two different dates, you do a little bit better. This shows you the overall comparison of our estimated yield versus theirs. One is just based on calibrating with simulations. The, this one is based on also throwing in some of the field data to help remove a lot of the biases, um, which is you know, an option if you do have the field data, but we're, not, we're trying not to rely on it. So we have these two different satellite measures. And what we've done is we've not only like said, OK, let's just say that we have a good estimate of yield, but let's take it the next step of like what would you do with yield measurements? And you, as I said before, if you were like a credit provider, you would want to know what's the yield history of this area. If you were an insurance provider, you would want to know like what's the conditions in this local region that I need to insure against, and is it at or below that level for my payouts? Um, if you were a farmer, you'd want to know something like what inputs actually help improve my yields. And we can start looking at that by looking at surveys of the inputs. So we did, and by we I mean the World Bank and their team in, in Uganda, um, we measured the plot areas. That was by walking the plots. We measured soil quality. That was actually by taking soil cores and sending them for chemical analysis. And we asked them about their fertilizer inputs. A lot of farmers don't apply any fertilizer, but there is quite a bit of variation. And what this plot is showing you is when you run a regression of what the outcome is, in this case yields, versus all these inputs, these are the coefficients that you get. Um, if I was an economist, I would show you a big table with lots of stars and, and p-values, um, but, but I'm not an economist. Uh, so this just, just shows you a, a, a sort of two standard error um, plot of the coefficient. If it's different from zero, that means it's significant, more or less. Um, and what you can see is a couple interesting things. So for those of you who are economists, um, you'll see that if you use self-report data, you actually see a very strong inverse relationship between field size and productivity. And economists have been a little bit obsessed with this in the past because they think this is a strong argument against consolidated. There's all sorts of discussions that, that hinge on this inverse field size productivity relationship. And what we find in this, and actually others have found recently in other studies, is that seems to be mainly an artifact of the fact that farmers overestimate yields much worse when they are dealing with small field sizes. So it's kind of an artifact of the measurement error. And we don't, if we're using any objective measure, whether it's the full plot harvest, the crop cut, I guess with the full plot, in this case, we see a slight inverse relationship. Or the, the two different remote sensing estimates, we really don't pick up a strong effect of field size. We do pick up a pretty significant effect of soils. So the soils folks will be, I, I guess, vindicated in terms of uh, soils matter, in particular, things like um, phosphorus out here. They, they're pretty important. But, um, but the self-report data was just simply too noisy to pick that up. And so if you kind of read papers saying that soil phosphorus doesn't really matter for productivity, you go better look at what their measure of productivity is. Um, and fertilizer, likewise, you can find no effects of fertilizer if you have a really poor measure of outcomes. Um, but you find it with the uh, field-based objective measures. And you also uh, find it with the remote sensing measures. I, I simplified this plot. We have, we've compared both pure stand fields, which is just maize, and then all of the other fields, which is more typical of this region, where you've got cassava and groundnuts and everything. And that one actually looked a little better. Maybe I should have taken that panel. It's a simpler thing when you're just dealing with maize. One of the problems in, in the, um, the case of the objective field-based measure, where it's a problem or a virtue, depending on what you're interested in, is that they only harvest the maize. They don't harvest all the other stuff. Whereas from satellites, we're kind of seeing a mixture of all of them. But you, you, you pick up a fairly significant positive effect, especially if you're on the, on the full plot field of the fertilizer effects. So um, as the objective yield measures and, the, and the, in particular the satellite yield measures get better, and as we either have more types of survey data, or in particular it's getting much easier to measure this fact rapidly, it's becoming much easier to interact with farmers on cell phones and, and amass large data sets about these things, uh, the hope is that we quickly generate insights into what actually drives yield variation, what actually are the combinations of factors, and what the um, some of the, the folks we're working with, I'll, I'll mention in a second, the, the actual names of the organizations. But one thing they're particularly interested in is like, can we customize recommendations? And one of the reasons that farmers don't like to listen to people or don't like to adopt inputs is that they often don't work because soils are quite heterogeneous from region to region. And if you're just applying one type of fertilizer, it might not be effective. But if you can understand that this region needs fertilizers with lime, 
uh, or you know, needs to be heavily limed, and then this mix of, of fertilizer, whereas this region needs something else, that really brings down the risks of adopting this, or it really brings up the benefits uh, compared to the cost. So I guess the, the thing to sort of take home from this is that I think we're on a pretty quick trajectory towards mainstreaming these approaches and understanding both developed and developing country agriculture. And in developing co uh, developed country context, I think what it'll do is it'll marginally bring down the cost. It'll, it'll push things along. It probably won't dramatic. I mean, we already understand these systems fairly well. It'll, it'll offer some new insights, like I was showing you about yield trends at a very uh, micro level. Um, but it certainly bring down the cost of, of precision ag techniques and stuff. But I think in the developing country setting is where it's really going to help very quickly improve our knowledge of these systems, which is um, inherently not very good because we haven't really had good data. Um, it'll also, I think, uh, in addition to creating maps that are useful for various purposes, um, it'll, it'll provide a means to just measure outcomes and track progress that countries are committing to. So a lot of countries are committing now to improving agricultural outcomes, investing in agriculture, and a lot of international groups are reluctant to feed money in without some clear way of measuring success, and this could provide an objective measure. If those of you who followed like the fertilizer subsidy programs in Africa realize maybe there's a lot of controversy around are these government self-reported statistics reliable because they're showing, you know, in many cases great responses to fertilizer subsidies, but we don't actually, there's a couple papers showing that you see no signal in the NDVI in this region, but the government is reporting a, a doubling of yields, and who, who should we believe? Um, I already talked a little bit about cheap subfield recommendations. I talked about in the context of developed countries. I don't think it's completely far-fetched that in developing countries, this could be actually quite useful to know if I only can afford, uh, you know, let's say 20 kgs of fertilizer, which part of my field should I put it on? I don't want to spread it evenly everywhere necessarily. Let me put it where it's going to have the highest return. It's a different type of question than um, what in the, is happening in developed countries, but it's the same idea. Um, Rapidly evaluating interventions is a, is a really, I think, actually the one that for us motivated this, which is that you have a lot of organizations going out and doing random, randomized control trials where you are, are assigning some treatment to some villages and not other villages. And again, um, economists in the room will, will probably be familiar with this. Um, but they often spend half their budget or more on actually measuring outcomes. And they only typically, because it's expensive, they only measure outcomes like that year. They don't continue to follow it over time and understand long-term impacts. So they're very interested in cutting their budgets and, uh, and still maintaining evaluation, especially because a lot of the funders for these NGOs want to see a rigorous evaluation um, if they're going to continue to invest. And they want to know what's working and what's not working. They're, they're the first to admit that 9 out of 10 things that they tried fail for some reason they, they didn't anticipate. And then I was talking about sort of customized interventions rather than just trying the same thing everywhere. Um, these are the... the uh, to give you a flavor, maybe I should have put this before, of, of the types of organizations that are really interested in these, um, in these approaches, uh, World Bank, LSMS team, I mentioned um, USA Ideas is now um, funding quite a bit of this work. One Acre Fund, Digital Green, these are all very um, interesting NGOs that you know, students might be interested in, in looking into. Um, and then some private sector uh, groups like Bob and Gona that are very interested as well. All right, so. Um, that's all I really want to say that um, for those of you interested in the environment uh, and, and progress, I do think it's really uh, a mistake to sort of forget about agriculture for too long because it is driving a lot of the fundamental issues related to conservation, related to um, water quality, to less of an extent related to climate change. Uh, as I was showing before, it's sort of the energy problem is taking over the climate change problem uh, as much as like methane and nitrous oxide are important, which they are. Um, uh, I think a lot of environmental problems uh, are, are driven fundamentally by issues in agriculture. And, and that's a good thing in the sense that we're already managing these lands. We already have a lot of incentives to manage them well. Um, but often it's, uh, for whatever reason, there are just a lot of leaks in the system. And data is certainly a way to, um, to improve that. So uh, with that, I will take plenty of questions. And I'm told we have um, beer promptly at 4. So you know. You can ask as many questions as you want. I'm happy to, but um, I'm just going to remind you as Stephen asked. Thank you. We need, we need to use the mic uh, for questions because it's uh, lectures being recorded. But questions? Oh, oh sorry. 
Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for your really interesting talk. You know, you focus a lot on the yield side of it, and it, but in the passing comment, you just mentioned something which I thought was really interesting, which is excess fertilizer applied is going to, you know, run off to the watersheds. Is there another parallel group that's maybe using these kinds of crop analytics to compare with downstream uh, fertil fertilizer content and, and runoff as a function of these different strategies that you're sh showing up? Space. Um, it's a good question. I think. Um, the short answer is, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I imagine there are improvements in how we measure water quality and nitrate loads, and, and that those data sets are becoming more available. Um, but it is a difficult problem. I, 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 have, I do recall some field experiments, and Stephen probably knows more than I do, in terms of actually trying to measure locally the, the runoff from individual fields. But in terms of integrating all sorts of nonpoint uh, sources and trying to actually detect effects of adoption of technologies is really difficult, um, partly because as you get to bigger and bigger scales, the amount of variation that you have access to, like to compare this field to that field, it, it is not so clear. So it, what ideally you would have is, for example, um, for whatever reason, some exogenous policy like that is really incentivizing adoption of precision techniques in this county, this county, and that county. And, and it's been much faster adoption there than this county, and that these counties somehow are feeding into different watersheds that you can, I mean, it would be, it would be great. Um, I think maybe a, a more viable thing might be groundwater level, uh, levels of nitrates, because those are more, I think, locally um, affected by policies. And that would be a cool study to look at um, you know, how, how groundwater levels are, are fluctuating with and without the adoption of these. But it does, uh, it does as I understand, soils are um, quite slow to change. And, it does, there, there's sort of a, 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 a pushing of the nitrates down into the groundwater that is not instantaneous. So it's a very slow um, accumulated benefit. But it, it, I mean, which raises the interesting question of how long after the technologies really take hold do we expect the, the dead zones to, to go away? And, and I don't know the answer to that. I think obviously this would just be one of many strategies like putting in buffer strips and riparian zones and all of that would be another one. Hi. How do you actually get from the satellite data to a yield like number? Mm. It's the yada yada part that I yeah. yada yada. Um, it essentially is, you know, we know a lot about crops and how they grow, and that, you know, you, you put a seed in the ground, they they grow through a, a certain amount of growth and development, and they have a certain amount of yield, which depends on that growth and development. So, generally speaking, if you see a really healthy crop, it's going to have a high yield. Um, so we embed that knowledge in, in simulation models. And so what we're doing is we're essentially taking a bunch of simulations. We try to simulate poor conditions, good conditions, early sowing, late sowing. And then we look at whatever observations we have of the field. And more or less, we're asking, like, which simulation does this look most like? And we're going to take the yield from that simulation. Now that, as I just described it, is actually not an optimal way computationally to do it, to like be looking at a simulation. So what we do is we just set up a big sort of machine learning <coughs> problem where you have Whatever dates you have observations, that's your observations. Uh, all the yields that we have in our data set are the response variable. You know, how do you predict y from all these x's? And then we just feed that sort of um, regression into the prediction scheme, and then we get. Now there's there's like you know 15 ways to try to estimate yields uh, from observations. There are much simpler ways than that, but the problem with the simpler ways is they often rely on some sort of local calibration, and we were just trying to avoid that. Thanks for a great talk. Um, so you showed a lot of uh, data on corn and the production of corn in the US. And most of that corn isn't actually being used to feed humans. So um, I'm just, I guess my question is like, the lady that you presented in Uganda, she can't just pull up her, her MacBook and look at like Planet Labs data and figure out where she needs to put her nitrogen. So um, how do you take this technology and actually use it to improve um, environmental sustainability and feeding the world's population, I suppose, is the kind of question. Um, OK, well, there's two elements to that question. Uh, one is about um, uh, the US system and how much does it actually contribute to, to food security. Um, but the other one is, is about in, in the systems where it's so obvious how it contributes to food security if you can improve production. Um, and improve knowledge of the system, how do you actually get that to be realized in a very low-tech situation? 
And I think the answer is that um, we're generally not working directly with the farmers. We're working with the institutions that are set up to in interact with and, and provide services to farmers. And sometimes these are um, nonprofits. Uh, they're giving away stuff for free or heavily subsidized, and sometimes they're private sector entities. But the point is that if farmers um, are offered a good product at a good price that works, uh, their business, I mean, she's a businesswoman just like the other one was a businesswoman, um, but they're businesswomen under very different circumstances. They can't risk their life savings on something that some person comes along and says might work, but their neighbor said didn't work at all. Um, so the, the idea, and there's been a lot of progress. So Africa has, you know, much of Africa has shown uh, uh, pockets of progress over the last decade, partly because these NGOs and these companies are actually starting to reach farmers. Um, and so One Acre Fund, for example, went from a couple thousand farmers to well over 100,000 farmers very quickly, um, because partly because they were providing high quality inputs at a reasonable price. I, I mentioned like counterfeit products is a big issue in a lot of these systems. Um, but partly because they were making good recommendations that worked. And to the extent that uh, they really, they being One Acre Fund or all the other organizations I showed, really want to be able to make better recommendations. They realize that oftentimes they're guessing, you know, with only slightly more knowledge than, and sometimes less local knowledge than what the farmer has. So the point uh, is a long way of saying that the idea is to help the people who are interacting with the farmers do their job better. That's how I think of it at least. And in the U.S., that's even true to some extent. It's like, you know, um, help the businesses who have the right business models or the, or the uh, government agencies who have, you know, some regulatory power, whatever it is, to do their job better. Um, because the reality is they don't do a very good job now, not because they're not smart, but because they just don't have the information they want. And as, like, One Acre Fund has the ability to quickly evaluate what's working, you know, it, it becomes m much easier to see a cycle of, uh, of returns for the farmer. And when they go out, you know, the disadoption rates, for example, of technology is very high because they don't work in the first year. Um, and so the idea is to improve that process. Yeah. No questions about my time at Brown, my memory is <laughs> um, Yeah, sorry, my question's not about that. But um, <laughs> I, I was wondering, you said like some of the older satellites are are privately owned, and then you said some of the newer ones are like um, owned by the state. And I guess I was wondering about like licensing. And are, are there are there like global political structures that are like licensing these satellites to like fly around the world? And do do states have like um, sovereignty over the the own like their own space like above their country? And does does that ever impact the kind of data you're able to collect? And how? Um, so the. I was a little bit unclear on that part, probably on, on lots of other parts too. Um, but on that part, what I meant to say is that there are lots of new satellites. Some of them are privately owned, some of them are publicly owned. The publicly owned ones, actually the, the Sentinel ones I was talking to are European um, investments, so they're out of Europe. The private ones are out of the Bay Area. We've been fortunate enough to have free access to both of them. Everyone has free access to the, the Sentinel European ones. Um, in the long term, the, the, the cost uh, structure of these private sector ones is, is open to question, but I think they're committed, at least um, what they say is they're very committed to these sort of social good applications um, because the marginal cost to them of doing them is not that high. Uh, there has never, to my knowledge, been issues of collecting imagery over particular countries. In, in many countries, it's, it's really the only way to access information, like especially politically very unstable and violent countries. So for example, we've been talking with the World Food Program and they already, to some extent, use these high-resolution sensors to really get a sense of what are the conditions very locally in some of these um, war-torn areas. Um, what is true is that people have had a lot of trouble flying drones and, and unmanned, any sort of um, any sort of airplane, manned or unmanned, in, in a lot of these countries. So a lot of researchers I know at, at these some of these um, other organizations they invest a lot in drones and then they can't get them through customs and and they're just sitting um, somewhere. So that's an argument for satellites as opposed to other technologies. The argument against satellites is frequent cloud cover um, and, and high launch costs, but those launch costs have come down. And the, the way to get around cloud cover, at least in the planet model, is just to image it essentially every day and try to hope that you get enough. Or in the Sentinel case, to just go at a different wavelength. Maybe one more question and then, and then beer. 
I'll also, I'm happy to answer questions at the beer, especially if they're on the Warriors. Um. <laughs> uh, thanks, that was great. Um, I was just wondering, um, maybe it's only applicable for the large, larger scale farms, but does this um, type of research have the ability to predict the better, best type of crop for, for a certain soil type? Or, um, and whether the crop that the farmer is actually sowing is actually maybe right. better suited or higher yield, mm -hmm. less fertilizer yeah. or another? Yeah, that is definitely one of the um, possible applications is looking, especially in these landscapes where farmers are growing lots of different things, um, you know, and, and, where, and where NGOs and others are trying to promote different crops. Like what are the, what are the places to do things well? One, one of the things we're doing in the US, sort of related to that, is we're using satellites not only to measure yields, but we're using them to measure um, the, the tillage practices, so whether or not they're tilling and whether or not they're cover cropping. And these are two, for those who follow the agricultural scene, which I know is most of you, that, um, the, the, there's a lot of controversy around the potential cost to yield of growing cover crops and the potential loss, uh, cost to yield of, growing, uh, of not tilling. There are benefits to both, um, especially in terms of nitrogen pollution and cover crops and, and energy use um, and soil erosion for tillage, but there are concerns about yield effects, so what we're doing is compiling these big data sets and then actually evaluating both for soybean and corn in a local sense. Do we see clear yield effects? If so, in what years, under what conditions? And, and gaining um, a better understanding as opposed to like running what, what the traditional approach would be is like you run some trials in a particular site for a couple of years and you get some sense of how things respond in that site. So we are doing that in the US and, the, and we've in Mexico, for example, we've looked at like the distribution of wheat yields versus the distribution of, of safflower yields and garbanzo yields, and you can see that they prefer different um, types of areas, and that could feed into this matching the crops as opposed to just, I, I think the way I was presenting it was like assume maize, now what's the best thing to do? And um, it, it can get much richer than that. Yeah, good question. All right, well, let's thank David again. and go to